Hey everybody, welcome to Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. This is episode number 225 of our YouTube channel and podcast, and I cannot be more excited to continue sharing with you guys personal finance topics that I think could be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. Today, we are going to be talking about taxes, and specifically how uh, some of the wealthiest individuals in the world have not paid that much in taxes, and some say would not pay their fair share in taxes, right? And I'm not here today to beat up on the wealthy, and I'm not here today to uh, you know, celebrate the fact that they have or have not paid certain amounts in taxes, but I wanna take an objective look at what they have paid in taxes relative to their wealth, relative to uh, the actual tax code, and then I'm gonna talk about some ways that us as individuals, uh, how we can take some notes from what they do and decrease our taxable income as well. Uh, so stay tuned for all that and more in today's episode. Before we get started though, if you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan and that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan that is specific to you and your family's needs and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just message me on any of the major social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and tell me that you are interested in financial coaching sessions. And we can set up sessions together uh, where we can start pushing towards your long-term financial goals and ultimately towards the goal of long-term financial freedom, which is what I hope uh, that all of you can attain from listening to this show, watching this show every single day. So this week, uh, there has been something very interesting that occurred. ProPublica, which is an online publication, uh, they came out with this big article on the wealthiest individuals in America and the taxes that they paid, specifically between 2014 and 2018. Uh, and it was really kind of a bombshell thing because you know it's not often that you get these types of IRS records. It's not often that you get this type of information on private individuals like Jeff Bezos, like Warren Buffett, like Elon Musk, like Michael Bloomberg, right? It's not often that you get this billionaire data, uh, but somehow they did. And actually the uh, IRS is talking about investigating how exactly they got this data. But nonetheless, I do want to go through this article and I want to talk to you uh, about specifically, you know, what these guys actually paid in taxes, right? Exactly uh, how much it was relative to the growth in their wealth, right? And how much it was relative to the income that they actually reported on uh, their particular uh, income tax statements. Now, I want to be clear that I am going to be fair both to uh, the people who wrote this article and uh, to the individuals who you know, paid these amounts in taxes or uh, reported these amounts of income. And I'm not going to try to call out anybody as wrong. And I'm not going to try to call out anybody as right. But I will say this before we get started. The individuals who wrote this article, uh, it's very comprehensive. It's a very, it's very comprehensive. It's a very good article. Uh, but they obviously had the thought process of these guys don't pay enough in taxes. Okay. That's basically the, uh, you know, whole precipice of uh, this article. These billionaires, they don't pay enough and I'm going to prove it to you. Okay. Now, I think maybe a little bit uh, their push is towards the fact that these millionaires and, excuse me, these billionaires are avoiding taxes. Uh, but I think more than avoiding it's actually these billionaires taking advantage of the tax code that is actually out there and actually being able uh, to know how to minimize their tax burden. Now, uh, to be fair to them, uh, and I think to be fair to us as well, right? If you could pay zero dollars in taxes, you absolutely would choose to do so if it were legal. True? Right. I would too, right? If, if I didn't have to pay taxes, I wouldn't pay taxes. Okay, but we do have to pay taxes, so we do. Okay? And it's the same thing with these individuals. These individuals, uh, quite obviously, if they don't have to pay a certain amount in taxes, then why would they pay that certain amount? Now, this is not to say that the tax system itself is not broken, right? But this is to say uh, that these individuals, what they've actually done, there's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing wrong with what they have done uh, with their wealth, what they have done uh, when it comes to paying taxes. But uh, you could argue uh, that the U.S. tax system, the U.S. tax code, uh, it endorses this type of behavior. It endorses 
uh, this type of wealth growth uh, without having to deal with taxes. Okay, and we'll talk about exactly how this works and how this can apply to your life and mine. So let's just dig right in okay so in 2007 jeff bezos then a multi-billionaire already uh, and he's now the world's richest man did not pay a penny in federal income taxes okay he achieved the feat again in 2011 in 2018 tesla founder elon musk the second richest man in the world also paid no federal income taxes michael bloomberg managed to do the same in recent years billionaire investor carl icon did it twice george soros paid no federal income tax three years in a row right uh, and george soros is somebody who you know the conspiracy theories aside uh, does fund a lot of democratic uh, agendas done does fund a lot of democratic politicians right who push for uh, higher tax rates on rich individuals, okay? But he's somebody who uh, paid no federal income tax three years in a row, right? ProPublica has obtained a vast trove of IRS data on the tax returns of thousands of the nation's wealthiest people covering more than 15 years. The data provides an unprecedented look inside the financial lives of American titans, including Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Rupert Murdoch, and Mark Zuckerberg. It shows not just their income and taxes, but also their investments, stock trades, gambling winnings, and even the results of audits. So you can see how this is very sensitive uh, tax data that they somehow got their hands on. But regardless, uh, we're going to go with it because they did get their hands on it. Now, taken together, it demolishes the cornerstone myth of the American tax system that everyone pays their fair share and the richest Americans pay the most. Okay, so this is where they jump right into uh, the fact that, you know, the uh, underlying narrative of everything that they're saying is that uh, these uh, individuals don't pay their fair share and they don't pay the most in taxes. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you up front uh, that they don't pay the highest percentage in taxes by a long shot. Okay, it's not even close when it comes to the percentage of taxes that they pay. But when it comes to the dollar amount, that may be a different question, but we'll jump into that uh, here shortly. Okay, so in general, right, the billionaires in America today, their wealth derives from the skyrocketing value of their assets like stock and property. Right. Many of these individuals who are some of the wealthiest in America today uh, are individuals that uh, own companies or are uh, large shareholders in companies that they run, right? And in being so, they get paid heavily uh, in stock. They get paid heavily in stock options, right? They may even get a nice salary that is a, a set amount of cash that they receive, right? Uh, but their wealth overall is driven by the increase in value of the companies that they own shares in, okay? So uh, they get those increases in value of those shares and they tend to own a lot of property as well. Those gains are not defined by U.S. tax laws as taxable income unless and until the billionaire sell. Now, this is the biggest thing, right? This is the biggest thing we go through and talk about these percentages that ProPublica talks about here uh, is that the tax law doesn't call uh, your increase in wealth that is not realized, meaning uh, you didn't sell whatever assets you had purchased, right? Uh, any wealth that is not realized, any growth in your wealth that is not realized, right? You don't have to pay taxes on that growth, okay? Uh, and there are many reasons that this might be the case. Well, let's just think for a moment, right? Uh, you've got Elon Musk. Elon Musk, as an individual who runs a company uh, that has a very volatile stock, or at least historically, the stock has been quite volatile, right? And that stock last year skyrocketed uh, hundreds of percent, just last year alone, 2020 alone, okay? How do you determine what he has to pay taxes on? Somebody might argue, oh, well, you know, maybe it could be the lowest stock price that year. Well, how would that be fair if you know, the stock price appreciated so much? Oh, well, maybe it'd be the highest. Well, how would that be fair if they don't remain at those highs and the stock market is overblown in that way? Or, you know, what if somebody said, just take the average or the median. Well, uh, maybe that doesn't work either because maybe that average or that median is not indicative of what the stock actually should be selling for or what the company is actually worth. It's very, very tricky when you have stock compensation because the value of the stock compensation is all relative to the market value of the company. And that is not some book value. It is a value uh, that is derived from uh, what buyers and sellers are doing in the market at any given time right? Uh, and based on what those buyers and sellers are doing, uh, uh, somebody's wealth could be extremely high at one point, and it could fall off quite a bit as well. I mean, Elon Musk, in now being the second richest man in the world, uh, was the richest man in the world uh, past Jeff Bezos when Tesla stock passed 
uh, $900 a share, right? But now that they're back in the $600 a share range, right, uh, his wealth fell off a large amount, okay? So we have to take into account that the fact that their wealth increases and decreases can change extremely quickly. I mean, Tesla lost 33% of its market value uh, over the course of weeks earlier this year, right? So this is nothing that is new. This is nothing that uh, we don't already know. But a lot of people who use these narratives, they don't understand. They don't understand uh, that what you're talking about is something that is volatile. And that what you're talking about is something that doesn't get bought and sold very much, even though these individuals, yes, own a stake in this company that is worth whatever amount, right? They're not cashing this amount out, right? Because if they cash that amount out, then the company would tank because nobody would trust uh, the leadership of the company, right? And there wouldn't be enough buyers around to, to get all of the shares that those individuals own. There wouldn't be enough people out there. Now, that's not to say that they don't sell large amounts. I mean, uh, Jeff Bezos has been well known uh, to sell billions of dollars in uh, Amazon shares annually to uh, do many things in his personal life, right? Uh, so it's no surprise that that actually happens. But he sells those shares in order to live his life, in order to pay for his lifestyle. And of course, he is going to pay taxes on the sale of those shares. Now, what's the problem? The problem is, is that reported income, that uh, realized gain that he has, is he paying enough on that realized gain? Okay, I think that is a really, really good question because uh, right now the highest capital gains tax rate in the United States is 20%. These individuals, right, uh, at the highest rate are going to pay 20% in capital gains tax. Okay, that's only 5% more than the average American would pay in capital gains tax. Okay, and this is when you buy something, you hold it for more than a year, and then you sell it for some gain. And then you don't pay taxes on all of that. You pay taxes on the gain. You don't pay taxes on everything that you take out. You pay taxes on the gain. So you can be extremely tax efficient with whatever you have. Now, obviously, the more that something appreciates in price, uh, the more you are going to have to pay in taxes. Okay, but again, it is not just taxes uh, on all of the money you take out. It is just taxes on the gains. Now, what ProPublica did here, right, is they compared how much in taxes the 25 richest Americans paid each year to how much Forbes estimated their wealth grew in that same period, right? So they were comparing uh, the taxes paid with wealth growth, right, which uh is based on the U.S. tax system is not uh, a fair uh, barometer. It's not a, a fair uh, way to measure how somebody's uh, taxable income was more or less than what they uh, should have been, or uh, they paid more or less in taxes than they actually should have. Okay, so they call this their true tax rate. Okay, now the results are stark. Uh, according to Forbes, those 25 people saw their net worth rise a collected. 401 billion from 2014 uh, to 2018. They paid a total of 13.6 billion in federal income taxes in those five years. Uh, that gives that true tax rate of only 3.4%. Uh, so in a $400 billion increase uh, in wealth, there was 13.6 billion paid in federal income taxes. Now, again, we have to think about this. Increase in wealth and then income taxes. Income taxes are not on wealth. Income taxes are on income, right? So if you want to tax the wealth, then they can tax the wealth, obviously. Uh, now, I, I'm not a big fan of that uh, proposal, but uh, you can tax the wealth, but don't act like uh, taxing the income and taxing the wealth are the same thing. So nonetheless, right? It is a completely different picture for middle-class Americans. For example, wage earners in their early 40s who have amassed a typical amount of wealth for people their age are from 2014 to 2018. Such households saw their net worth expand by about $65,000 after taxes on average, most due to the rise in the value of their homes. But because the vast bulk of their earnings were salaries, their tax bills were almost as much, nearly $62,000 over that five-year period. So basically saying uh, these individuals, uh, their increase in wealth was almost exactly the same amount over that five-year period as the amount of taxes that they paid over that five-year period. Now, again, why are these individuals paying so much in taxes uh, relative to their wealth? Well, because most of what they have uh, is income. It's taxable income. It's paid in salaries and wages, right? They are not taking assets that they own that create income for them or that appreciate in price Right? And then they sell those things uh, after holding them for more than a year. Right, that, That's not what's going on uh, with middle-class Americans. Now, again, 
this can be a question of the U.S. tax code, right? Should this be the case uh, that you can have wealthy individuals that have enough money that they can live off of their investments, right? They've built this wealth to where they can live off of their investments and be extremely tax efficient based on U.S. tax law, right? Should they be able to do that while the typical American uh, is having to pay uh, taxes on most of the money that they ever get their hands on uh, and their wealth typically is not increasing as much as the amount that they're paying in taxes over a five-year period, okay? So this is fair, right? I think this is a very fair assessment uh, when it comes to, you know, is U.S. tax law fair, right? Is U.S. tax law actually, uh, you know, taxing those uh, in the middle class as much as it's taxing those at the top? And I think uh, the resounding answer is no, but then the question becomes, how do you fix it? And where do you draw the line? Right. Because there are middle class individuals who do have capital gains all the time and there are upper, upper middle class people who have capital gains and there are lower class people even who invest and are trying to get ahead and have capital gains. Right. How do you tax their capital gains and how do you say right, that we're going to tax the capital gains of certain individuals above a certain wealth class? at a certain percentage. Like it's very difficult to draw the line. Now I'm not saying the line should not be drawn. I'm just saying, where do you draw that line? Because obviously, right, uh, if you're talking about tax revenue, you would expect in a progressive tax system uh, that as you do have higher incomes, right, then you would pay more in taxes. Well, again, uh, these wealthy individuals don't necessarily have the highest incomes, right, but they have the most wealth. OK, so the U.S. government naturally is trying to come up with ways to get their hands on that wealth in some way, shape or form. Uh, and uh, people really take a look at that wealth when that wealth is being used for income like these individuals have. OK, so let's just look at four of these ultra wealthy individuals. Let's start with Warren Buffett. I talk about Warren Buffett a lot on the show. I really like Warren Buffett. He's one of my favorites. Um, and so I want to just talk about him for a moment. Okay, between 2014 and 2018, his wealth grew by $24.3 billion. Do you know what that was? That was the increase in the value of Berkshire Hathaway stock over a five-year period. So he created, via his management of that business, $24.3 billion in wealth growth for himself. Okay, now, he reported total income of $125 million in that five years. So that means on average... He was getting $25 million a year in income. Now, some of that uh, undoubtedly was in salary, but I'm sure some of that was also uh, in the form of uh, him selling some of his shares and being able to uh, take some of that money out, right? And his total taxes paid on that total income reported was $23.7 million. And so he paid about 20% uh, in federal taxes, a little less than 20% in federal taxes because 20% of 125 million is about 25 million and he paid 23.7 million in total taxes. Well, that's not surprising given that the capital gains rate for somebody at his level would be 20%. Okay. Now, ProPublica did this true tax rate, right? Uh, where they said uh, the total taxes paid relative to the wealth growth, right? And since he created so much wealth, uh, they called the true tax rate at 0.1%. OK, but what if he didn't grow the company? Right. What if he didn't grow the company at all and just remained uh, with the shares that he had? Right. Would you call uh, his true tax rate, you know, several hundreds of percent or several thousands of percent? Absolutely. They would not. Right. And the reason that they wouldn't is because uh, they're looking at the fact that, oh, well, he did create value. And that's the pushback that I have is that if value is created, uh, then why are we uh, asking so much in the way of taxes from value creation when it's really not ever money that these individuals want to touch? OK, so nonetheless. All right. That's Warren Buffett. Then Jeff Bezos, ninety nine billion dollars in wealth growth because Amazon stock took off over that five year period. OK. Total reported income, way more than Buffett, of $4.22 billion and ended up paying $973 million in taxes to come to their true tax rate of 0.98%. Okay. Then Michael Bloomberg, all right, $22.5 billion in wealth growth, $10 billion in total reported income, $292 million in total taxes paid, and a 1.3% true tax rate uh, in the way that ProPublica talks about it. Okay. Then Elon Musk. Uh, a wealth growth of 13.9 billion, 1.52 billion in total income reported, 455 million in total taxes paid, and a true tax rate then of 3.27%. Okay, so again, this true tax rate 
uh, is not really indicative of the U.S. tax code, but what it does seem to be indicative of is what the individuals who wrote this article think uh, that these individuals should be taxed on, right? Because they feel like this wealth growth is um, equivalent to income in some way, shape, or form, right? And I think, yes, some of it is, okay? Some of it uh, should be treated like income, but not all of that should be treated like income because it's the company, okay? And yes, these individuals, they run these companies, Okay, but Warren Buffett runs Berkshire Hathaway far less than he ever has. Okay, Jeff Bezos is leaving Amazon. Okay, uh, but he's still going to be a huge Amazon shareholder, obviously, because he created the company and knows the people who are going to take over for him. He's still going to be the biggest shareholder, in much the way that uh, when um, you know Bill Gates left uh, Microsoft as their uh, CEO, he still held a ton of Microsoft stock and was still one of the richest men in the world. Right. Uh, so the question really becomes: What what do we do about this? Right. Uh, how do they actually pay their fair share? Because if we look at this just objectively, okay, we can all agree. Should they pay more in taxes because they have more money? Probably so, right? If we're trying to be as fair as possible, yes. But we have to, in some way, shape, or form, determine how uh, we are going to treat the income that they create because their income is so different than the income that you and I and many people around the world receive. Because most people are receiving income that is paid directly to them with most of it taxable, okay? Uh, but these individuals are able to take advantage of the fact uh, that tax laws will allow them to grow their wealth without having to pay taxes on the growth of that wealth. And they can sell some of that wealth that they have. They can sell some of the shares in the companies that they own and companies that they run, right? And pay less in taxes than if they just got paid directly by those companies. Okay. Uh, so really it's, it's kind of a, a way that, you know, if they're paid in a certain way, yes, it may align their interest with the company and allow the company to grow and create value. Uh, but it may also end up allowing them to pay less in the way of taxes. So the question is really, uh, you know, what can we do about this? And I don't have a perfect answer for you. Okay. I don't know exactly what, uh, should be done about, uh, these individuals and, and the fact that uh, they did pay so little in taxes and likely continue to do so. Okay. But what can we be sure of? We can be sure that there are plenty of people out there thinking about this, right? And we can be sure that there are a lot of people out there asking the same question, right? What would I suggest, right? Well, I would suggest that based on some level of wealth, okay, increasing in the capital gains tax rate uh, would likely be one of the more efficient things that could be done right? And also uh, maybe even getting rid of the capital gains tax rate uh, for people over a certain amount of wealth and only allowing the capital gains tax rate uh, if you're below uh, a certain income or wealth level. And then if you're above that income or wealth level, then it should get taxed at an income tax rate uh, that is requisite to wherever you are. Because uh, yes, do I think they should pay a fair share? Yes, but more than the fair share? Absolutely not. I, I'm, I've always been a big fan of flat taxes or the flattest uh, taxes that we can have, right? Uh, and so I think that should also apply uh, to some of the largest uh, and wealthiest individuals out there when it comes to uh, business acumen. So let's talk about just real quick, uh, what are ways that we can go about decreasing our taxable income? Because if they are decreasing their taxable income, then wouldn't we want to do the same? Absolutely. Okay. Well, what you can do, right, is you can put money away in IRAs and 401ks, right? IRAs, they can either, uh, in a traditional sense, right, they can uh, decrease your taxable income today, but you will have taxes in retirement. Or if you're using Roth accounts, right, you can have the same taxable income today and then not pay taxes in retirement when you take that money out, uh, which is beneficial, right? You can fund your kid's college, you know, their college fund, their ESA, their 529, whatever, and get some tax breaks there. Uh, in doing so, you can fund a health savings account, which gives you a triple tax advantage, right? You get a tax break up front, uh, you get tax-free growth, and then you get tax-free withdrawals on the back end as well. So you can do that. You can give money away, right? Giving money away to even uh, religious organizations uh, or you know any type of 501c3 uh, can allow you uh, to write off a good bit of your income in the way uh, of giving your money away. Now, you can keep a file of medical expenses and write off your medical expenses as well. Uh, that's something you can absolutely do. You can also be very tax efficient in your investing. Right? I've talked about tax efficient investing before. Uh, and if you don't think that some of these biggest, wealthiest 
you know, business moguls out there uh, are out here, you know, being extremely tax efficient, then you're crazy, right? They have uh, these accountants and these CPAs that work for them that are trying to make sure that they pay as little as possible in the way that they go about selling their investments and the way that they go about buying their investments in certain ways, right? If you own uh, investments within brokerage accounts, taxable brokerage accounts, uh, then understanding how you can take those investment gains out uh, and use those investment gains at some of the lowest tax rates possible because tax rates are very low for a lot of people who make modest incomes if they have some investment growth uh, and that can be really useful to you and it can allow you to get some of that free tax-free income uh, as well okay so i want you to understand this a lot of the ways in which uh, these wealthy individuals decrease their taxable income you and i just can't do right because you and i don't have uh, the assets outstanding to just live on the appreciation of those assets uh, or just live on the income that those assets create. Now, eventually, obviously, that's what we want. We want to be able to live off of uh, the income that our assets create. We want to live off the appreciation in our assets. Of course, we want to do that. And we want to do it, obviously, in the most tax efficient way possible because Right? You get to retirement, taxes can be one of the biggest uh, things that keeps you from getting the most money possible out of what you actually save for yourself. So, of course, you want to minimize taxes, okay? Uh, I'm not saying that minimizing taxes is a bad thing. I think minimizing taxes is something we should try to do, okay? But I also think that uh, we are in an imperfect system, okay? Our system is imperfect. Uh, we don't have the perfect tax code that works the exact same for everybody, Right? There are people on both ends of the spectrum, very wealthy, uh, and people who are very poor, who are uh, you know, really getting uh, tax breaks that people in the middle aren't. Right? And then there's people on both ends uh, who are paying a lot more than maybe they should relative to the middle. Okay? Uh, and there are a lot of people in the middle uh, who shouldn't be paying near what they should. And there's a lot of people in the middle who don't know how to be tax efficient and they're paying a lot more than they actually should, right? Uh, so there's just a lot of brokenness in our tax system. And naturally, uh, it does benefit the wealthy quite a bit, right? It does benefit those uh, who have appreciation in assets, who have uh, this wealth that grows quite a bit. Uh, but if something's going to be done about it, my guess is that uh, an article like this ProPublica article uh, would go a long way towards pushing towards uh, some type of tax reform. Now, am I sitting here calling for higher taxes? No. Am I sitting here calling for lower taxes? No. Am I sitting here calling for uh, taxes that work well for all of us? Absolutely, right? I want tax systems uh, that we can look around and say, okay, this seems about right, right? That there's not such huge disparities. And again, as long as we have these individuals who increase their wealth year over year because they own these businesses who, whose stocks are high flying and they have stock compensation, they have stock option compensation, their money is going to look way different than yours. Not just in the fact that they increase their wealth and have so much wealth, but their money is going to look way different than yours because uh, the money that they put in their pockets is going to come from a different place than the money that you put in your pocket. But then the question becomes, what do we do about it? Okay. And again, that's been my whole theme to this episode is what do we do? What do we do uh, if we have a problem uh, with the wealthy paying so little? What do we do uh, if we have a problem in the middle class bearing the burden uh, on a percentage basis far more uh, than the top? What do we do? But I do just want to leave you with this uh, and you, know, you can make the assumptions you want out of this fact. Jeff Bezos from 2006 to 2018, his wealth grew $127 billion. Obviously, Amazon's a great company. That's why. Okay. You know how much you paid in taxes? $1.4 billion. So a huge disparity between how much his wealth grew and how much he paid in taxes. Again, is this wrong? No, right? Because he did follow the rules and follow the law. Okay. Uh, but paid $1.4 billion in taxes relative to $127 billion in wealth growth. The average American household, right? They paid $142,000 in taxes over the period from 2006 to 2018. Their wealth grew on average by $89,000, okay? So on average, the American household paid $53,000 more in taxes than their wealth grew over a 13-year period, okay? Something's broken. Something's gonna have to be fixed, but also as American citizens, as the middle class, right? Maybe we need to take this into our own hands too. make investments, vote for people who are going to fix these types of systems, 
right? Do the things that we need to do in order to pay as little in taxes as possible, right? Actually be a part of the appreciation and wealth. Be a part of Amazon stock and Berkshire Hathaway stock uh, and invest in a way that will allow us to grow our wealth into the future. And maybe we can be some of these people who can live off of our wealth and pay as little in taxes as possible, right? Now, maybe they'll change the tax system by then, but uh, maybe not. But again, uh, we want to do what's best for ourselves. And obviously what's best for us is to keep as much money in our pocket that is ours as possible. And probably that's the same thought process that these wealthy individuals have, uh, but we find it hard uh, to see it from the other side of the page. So thanks for watching this episode. If you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast. Uh, and then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Uh, just message me on any of the major social media sites, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and just tell me that you are interested in financial coaching sessions. And then we can begin working together, uh, building financial freedom, working on your financial goals, uh, and pushing you towards being the most that you can be uh, in your financial life. So tune in Monday as I continue talking about personal finance topics that I think can be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. So thanks for tuning in to this episode of Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. God bless.